it's a uh, it's a uh, very popular uh, defense 44 attendees <laughs> oh, right. i think from colombia and from different mm -hmm. places so this is uh, a sign it's not for uh, by by uh, by chance so sara is very popular and very nice uh, uh, so uh, today is the uh, final phd defense of uh, uh, sandra uh, medina munoz uh, sara uh, did uh, her phd under the supervision of uh, professor torovi linkness uh, and uh, recently torovi has uh, left Kaust, as you know, uh, I'm just like facilitating now uh, administration procedure and uh, uh, eventually uh, involved in the final thesis uh, uh, restriction and uh, uh, final corrections. And so uh, it's under my uh, uh, maybe uh, responsibility, but uh, she worked with Prof. Prof. Torovi until the last minute, uh, a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, so Sarah, uh, as you know, the procedure you have uh, uh, 40 minutes, let's say in average, 35 to 40, 45 minutes maximum mm -hmm. uh, to uh, present uh, your uh, work uh, during these last uh, busy uh, years. And uh, after that, we give the floor to uh, the audience, uh, big audience. Now 46 is increasing by the maybe time <laughs> <laughs> difference uh, to give uh, questions so, uh, for some time and uh, then uh, they will quit the meeting. Uh, and we, keep, we give the uh, floor to the uh, committee, defense committee, to uh, discuss your uh, work, uh, etc. Uh, and after that, we also uh, invite you to quit uh, by giving me the uh, hand of the Zoom yeah. for some time for internal discussion. And we uh, call you back. Everyone else can come back. Uh, so. Uh, for, for the, uh, this is the procedure. Uh, we, we will come back to that. So now the floor is yours and uh, good luck. And well, I think the, everybody's, uh, look, I, th I think we see the, mm -hmm. uh, the slides. Is yeah. okay. Good, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Hello everybody. Thank you for attending my PhD. This is entitled Understanding of Microfoulance in Produce Water and their interactions with ceramic membrane materials. I appreciate if you please could turn your camera on, it will be easy to connect with you. And I will take only 40 minutes of your time to tell your story. And it's a story about my research in the last five years. My story started here in 2013. I was working in the environmental department of this oil field operation in Colombia, a beautiful area rich on biodiversity between Colombia and Venezuela. And I didn't know in that moment, but uh, the fluid that was extracted from the oil wells is not just oil and water. Actually, most of this fluid is water, and this water streams that flows from a producing reservoir is called produced water. In this experience, I realized the key role that produced water plays in a more sustainable operation of the oil field and the challenges in its treatments, which personally motivate me to pursue my PhD around produced water. One of the challenges is the volume. In this graph, it is shown the global volumes produced in dashed lines related to the type of hydrocarbon. Worldwide, it is estimated that it can be as much as 400 million barrels per day. This is equivalent to filling 20 water trucks every second. This represents significant cost in transportation and in water treatment. Another challenge is the composition. You know, produced water, it comes from different hydrocarbons and therefore the composition is very diverse and specific to the site location and to the operational conditions. Once the production fluid is extracted, the first step is to separate the oil and gas where the chemicals are applied to destabilize the motion. And then the fluid left is what we call produced water. It contains fossil water from the reservoir that could be six times more saline than sea water. It has residual oil and gas. It has chemicals that, are, that were added during the production, antifoams, biocides, corrosion inhibitors, and, and others. And it can have bacteria as well. This water needs to be treated, no longer for recovering the oil, but for meeting standards or of disposal and reuse. Usually produced water that, that's treated is disposed back deep in the subsurface formation. It could be injected uh, also for pressure maintenance. Red cases, it is disposed on surface, can be used to recharge aquifers, or we can give also use for agriculture and even potable reuse. 
The conventional treatment does a pretty good job reducing the, the dispersed oil content by removing the oil droplets that are bigger than 10 micrometer, which is seven times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. So you have a reference there. And conventional treatments usually include plate interceptors, gas flotation, hydrocyclones, and they, um, they are pretty well established in the industry. However, these systems have low efficiency removing emulsified oil and submicron contaminants. Therefore, further treatment promises turning what is essentially a waste into a resource. And here is where membrane filtration using ceramic membranes represents a robust technology capable to operate under a wide variety of produced water characteristics. If you imagine a filtration, how it works, well, we pass the contaminated water through the membrane to obtain cleaner water. In this case, the membrane is ceramic, usually is made of metal oxides, such as alumina, zirconia, and titania. And the advantages of ceramic membranes is that they have shown great long-term performance under high temperatures and aggressive chemicals. However, the main drawback of this technology is membrane fouling or clogging, where the accumulation of the contaminants leads to a higher resistance to flow. And this reduces the membrane lifetime and also leads to higher capex and opex. The membrane fouling is complex in produced water. The oil droplets can coalesce and they form a, a gel layer. The oil droplets are deformable, so they can squeeze through the pores, contributing to intraport blocking. Also, you have surface active components and submicron oil droplets that can get absorbed into the membrane pore walls. We can partially recover the membranes using hydraulic and chemical cleaning. However, not completely due to irreversible fouling where these two phenomena in green have been identified as the key factors in irreversible fouling. All these mechanisms can occur in, are occurring simultaneously and they are not well understood. Therefore, our objective was to understand in the first place these surface, these submicron contaminants and how they interact with the ceramic membrane materials. In our first objective, we start at visualizing and quantifying the droplet size distribution using microscopy techniques. Then in the second objective, we study how surfactants were absorbing into the ceramic materials. And also how efficient were the hydraulics and chemical cleaning in the objective three. And finally, we apply all these method methodologies and protocols that we develop to study an oil field produced water in the objective four. So I will go through each of these objectives to show you what we found. In the first one, microscopy techniques, our first hypothesis was that the membrane fouling during produced water is related to the droplet size, whereby submicron droplets plays a key role in the irreversible fouling of microfiltration, ultrafiltration ceramic membranes. So our first question was, how can we characterize these tiny submicronoid droplets? How small can they get in the real produced water and how can we see them? So after doing all the literature review, we identified that the microscopy techniques can give us an answer. So we decided to explore four different microscopy techniques to visualize and characterize the submicron droplets. We have epifluorescent microscopy, we have confocal microscopy. These two are part of the optical microscopy that, uh, the, where we can see oil droplets and features in the range between 10, uh, 200, from 250 nanometers up to 10 micrometers. And the electron microscopy, in this case, we use cryo SEM and cryo TEM, where we analyze down to the nanoscale sizes which are comparable to the sizes of the COVID-19, just to give you an example of which ranges are we talking about. There are many commercially available microscopy-based methods that can measure oil droplet size distribution. However, the minimum size that they can detect are droplets around one to two micrometer of diameter. So what we did was actually pushing the limit further to look at the tiny droplets at 150 nanometer size. So how we did this? Well, we optimized each of the steps in bold, which are first, sample immobilization, second, imaging capturing, third, image post-processing, and fourth, the statistical analysis of the data. Uh, the microscopy equipment that we use was the LSM 710 of SAIS microscope, which is a confocal microscope, but also takes epifluorescence images. 
the advantage of this technique is that it uses fluorescence to generate the image. You know, in our sample crude oil droplets, they have an intense fluorescence thanks to its aromatic hydrocarbons. So the oil droplets can be easily identified. We had a limited volume of real oil field produced water. So what we used uh, first was a synthetic emulsion to tune the protocols. This emulsion was made by hydrate mixing of crude oil with surfactant, in this case, SDBS, and water. Now, uh, when we are talking about the first step, it's sample immobilization, right? So look at this picture. This is how uh, it looks in the microscope if you put the sample liquid as it is. It looks blur and it's because bromial motion. We cannot use this type of images. So we, it needs, the, the droplet size needs immobilization. After many trials, the BERS protocol that we found uh, was gelling the emulsion. This is how it looks after the mobilization, much better and we can have a very good contrast. Uh, the protocol is very easy. You just add the low temperature ag agarose uh, in, and, and this allowed to have a very thin layer of gel on the microscope slide, which could be stored in a freezer for weeks to be analyzed. After mobilization, we compared the images obtained by the two techniques, epifluorescence and confocal. We identified that epi fluorescent was the most convenient technique because it captures a larger area of sample in each snap and it does not have photobleaching like what's happening in the confocal. So from now, we were using only epifluorescent and we move into the post-processing. So we start with the original image and we take very specific steps until having the final image where we can calculate the diameter of each of the droplets that we identify. And with this, we proceed to calculate the droplet size distribution. This was the droplet size distribution that we obtained for the synthetic produced water. We calculate the polydispersity index, which is based on the mean droplet size and the standard deviation. And it gave us a value of 0.35, which indicates that we create an emulsion that is relatively narrow distribution of droplets. And now that we define the protocol, we proceed to apply it into the real oil field produced water samples. We work with these two. So in the left one, you have the Saudi Arabian PW1, and in the right side, you have the Bahrainian PW2. Uh, and this one, in, these were the image that we obtained in the fluorescence. In PW2, we found less population of oil droplets because it, has, it had lower oil content here. And both, both oil fields produce water have a peak around 500 nanometers with a broader density compared to the synthetic uh, emulsion. PW1 has a higher PDI of 0.89 compared to PW2, which means that we have a polydispersed distribution of droplets, which made the sample not suitable for other methods such as light scattering. So with this, we conclude in the optical microscopy that the, the, we develop a method to quantify droplet size distribution that can be applicable to compare changes before and after certain treatment, such as coagulation or filtration processes. The advantage is that the sample is preserved, will prevent coalescence or, or creaming happening. It is suitable, suitable for polydispersed samples and also that is very selective to oil droplets and also especially suitable for produced water because you are just ignoring other contaminants such as dust, gas, bacteria that uh, are present in the water. The limitations are that we have, of course, the limit of the optical microscopy resolution of 150 nanometers, and it's time consuming. I mean, compared to the inline system, uh, this, this time that is consumed will could be improved by artificial intelligence uh, on the image post-processing especially. So now let's dive in into the electron microscopy techniques that we apply. So what is the difference? Well, in scanning electron microscopy, produces images of the sample by scanning the surface with a focus beam of electrons. In, the, in this case, we use a cryogenic fixation because water, well, is the most abundant constituent in the sample and it's key to preserve the oil droplets morphology. So we use two freezing methods. The first one was plunge freezing. The second was high pressure freezing. In high pressure freezing, the sample is rapidly chilled while exposed to a high pressure. So it avoids the formation of ice crystals. And now for, for tuning the droplet, the, the, the method, we use a synthetic emulsion as well with higher concentrations of oil. And we gel the sample before freezing. So in this case, the gel, the agarose, provo uh, provide a honeycomb structure 
to embed the oil droplets after the ice was removed by sublimation. So here are the images that we obtained in the, free, in the freeze fracture plane of the sample. We found that during, high, during uh, plunge freezing, uh, the, the ice formation press the oil droplets and, and deform their shape. So that's why it appears like an smudge, like it's look here in this yellow circle. And around is the honeycomb structure of the agarose. And therefore the oil droplets could not be visualized in their spherical form. With high pressure freezing on the other side, it preserved the morphology of the oil droplets. We could observe oil droplets between 50 nanometers up to 20 nanometers like this, this big one. However, the vitrified freeze fracture plane was extremely vulnerable to sublimation and only a small amount of the sample remained. Therefore, it is difficult to know whether uh, the, the, the oil droplet was, was, the, the, it was representative to the, to the sample. So we found as conclusion that the high pressure freezing, uh, this method was great for visualization, but not for quantification of the droplet size distribution. Okay, so now we move into the cryo TEM. What is the difference? Uh, in cryo TEM, we frozen the emulsion. In this case, we didn't use agarose. We frozen in a very thin film of 300 nanometers thickness. So we obtain an image from the beam of electrons that is transmitted through the sample, like it looks in this one in image A. Then I proceed to post-process the image in different steps. Uh, and using the Hugh circle transport to identify the, cir the circles. And then we obtain the values of the diameters and we proceed to obtain the droplet size distribution. So with cryo TEM, we were able to estimate it. And in, in this concentrated sample, it has a range between uh, from 15 nanometers size droplets until 300 nanometer with a wide range of oil droplets density in the image. And therefore, we said cryo TN, it's a very suitable technique to quantify oil droplets in the nano range with emulsions with high concentration of oil. Now, we apply this protocol to the real oil field produced water. Uh, these are the results for the Saudi Arabian PW1 and the Bahraini PW2. We, uh, as expected, we, we found some oil droplets, but they were very few, if you see here in the image, in, in frequency, in density. We still identify some oil droplets as small as 20 nanometers. However, the most interesting part was to observe the presence of other submicron colloidal aggregates, like this one that are here in the, in the dotted squares. Uh, these, these smudges or these aggregates were found in a higher density than the oil droplets. And we wanted to know more, uh, and because the sample uh, had a very low concentration of oil, we decided to filter them and see what was retained in the membrane. So this is the top view of the contaminated filter. This image was taken by the cryo SCN. In this case, the objective was not to preserve the oil droplets, but to analyze the elemental composition of the contaminants. This analysis was performed using EDS. In this case, uh, in the sample of PW1, we found these brown and flat solids with high content of sulfur. The sulfuric particles could be associated with corrosion residues as the PW1 sample was sour and also saline. Now this is the image of Bahraini PW2. We found a smoother distribution of organics covering the membrane surface and there was no evidence of sulfur but some calcium. So as, as conclusion of these electron microscopy techniques, we have that epifluorescence, uh, definitely the gel Immobilization sample was very suitable uh, technique to reach down to 150 nanometers. Cryo TEM revealed the presence of not only submicron droplets, but also submicron colloidal particles in a higher density population. These submicron contaminants will be, will not, wouldn't be removed by conventional deoiling technologies, and it might cause intrapore blocking in membrane filtration downstream. Also, cryo SEM and EDS complement information about the nature of the contaminants. So now if we look back into the hypothesis that, that we had initially, uh, where, where we're saying that the submicron oil droplets might play a key role. But after this research, we might change this statement and saying that instead of the oil droplets, we should focus on studying these colloidal aggregates that could be, uh, and that could be a probably a, another PhD. So with this, uh, I will move on into the, um, the second objective. We finalized the first one. 
Uh, and in the second and third objectives, this one absorption and cleaning of surfactants uh, were based on the same set of experiments. So I will proceed to explain what we found here. In this uh, second objective, our hypothesis was that the surfactant absorption is an important fouling mechanism in ceramic membrane filtration. And it makes us wonder, how can we measure the impact of these surfactants in the metal oxides? And how strong are these interactions? Is it possible to clean the surfaces afterwards? Do surfactants absorb differently depending on the type of metal oxides? So for this one, I want you to explain the methodology that we use. It was very key. It's called QCND or quartz crystal microbalance with dissipation. QCND has been extensively used in membrane fouling, mostly in polymeric membranes, but there were studies done, few studies done in, in ceramic membrane materials. QCND is a very sensitive balance that in real time measures not only the mass, but it gives you information about the mechanical properties of the substances. The sensor is a quartz crystal resonator. It looks like this. Uh, we use, uh, and these sensors are coated in different materials. In this case, we were using alumina, titania, and zirconia. And the experiment happens on the sensor surface. So you have the oscillating sensor. And when something is absorbing, the resonance of the sensor in different overtones is disturbed. And the sensor will show a decrease in the frequency like this and an increase on the dissipation. This information is then translated into mass using uh, models, depending if the film that is attaching is rigid, if it's quasi-viscoelastic or viscoelastic. The classification will depend on the dissipation value, if it is above or below uh, the value of 10 power minus six. And also, uh, you have to look at how the frequencies are spread in each overtones. The curves will overlap, like in this case, for rigid films, uh, as they tightly copy, couple, it, couple it with the oscillating sensor, and they will spread as more viscoelastic is the film. To give you an overview of the experiments, so as soon as we fed the surfactant solutions into the QNCMD, the frequencies started to decrease here, and um, uh, that means that uh, the mass is absorbing. So we calculate the rate of absorption. We wait until the absorption reaches an equilibrium. And after this, we apply hydraulic cleaning. And in some cases, like in this example, the, we couldn't recover completely the surface. We apply then a chemical cleaning with a strong chemical called Helmanex. We register the percentage of efficiency of the cleaning on, on each of the cleaning steps. So we initially, the surfactants that we were using, that we were feeding into the system, we started using charged surfactants for these experiments. We use an ionic SDVS, which has a negative head, and cationic CTAV with a positive head. We prepared solutions of these three surfactants in concentrations and different pH. And uh, this pH were above and below the point of zero charge of the metal oxides, which are these values. The point of zero charge is important because that pH is, is that pH at which the net charge of the surface is equal to zero. And above or below this pH, the surface can be positive or negative over the charge. So here we have the results of the SDVS. We have here the three metal oxides, the pH of the solutions, and the surface charge of these metal oxides in these cases. Uh, the surface charge, uh, and, and we found that here, yeah that under acidic conditions, the SDVS absorption rates were lower compared to other pH conditions, but the mass was absorbed in the, in the acidic was the highest. So it might, at first sight, we might think that this is attributed to electrostatic interactions between negatively charged SDVS and positively charged metal oxides. But if we look at the results of the hydraulic cleaning, the efficiency was very low compared to the rigid films. So we think this is correlated to the mechanical pro properties of the film, where quasi-viscoelastic films were more difficult to remove compared to the rigid films. We proceed then to do a chemical cleaning of these uh, quasi-viscoelastic films, and still we, could, uh, we couldn't recover the, the surface, especially for zirconia in this case. In zirconia, we apply even two cycles of chemical cleaning, and still we couldn't recover the, the, the zirconia. This suggests a stronger absorption between acidic SDVS and the metal oxide, which is possible due to hydrophobic interactions. 
in this figure, we can see we applied two cycles of, of chemical and it was very interesting to see how the Helmanex agent was acting with the film. In the first step, you have a very, uh, a very abruptly increase in the dissipation. That means the, the, the Helmanex is attaching to the surface and making that much fluffy, more softer. And then it start to uh, decrease the absorption, it start dissolving everything. And when we put water, uh, it finally washed out what, what was in the, in the surface. However, as I mentioned, we couldn't recover the surface after two chemical cleanings. So these insights of how the chemical agents interacts and removes the absorbers of factors films are very crucial in gaining a better understanding of the chemical cleaning mechanisms and the process of ceramic membranes. Now, if we move into the uh, CTAB, the, the cationic surfactant, we found that the surfactant was absorbing to all metal oxides, regardless of the pH conditions, with exemption to alumina at neutral pH, in which I won't go into details, and you can refer to our paper here. This finding suggests that the electrostatic repulsions between positive CTAB and positively charged surface was not enough to prevent the surfactant absorption, and therefore other supermolecular interactions are occurring. Other interesting detail was that the type of film the CTAB was forming. Most of them were quasi-viscoelastic or viscoelastic films, as you see in this column. Uh, and we noticed that the cleaning of uh, was more difficult for uh, as more viscoelastic was the film. So surfaces with quasi-viscoelastic films were cleaned after one chemical cycle but uh, the viscoelastic films, we needed actually several cycles and still we couldn't recover the, the surface. Very similar results compared to the SDVS that we had previously. So after this work uh, with charged surfactants, we conclude that electrostatic interactions should not be taken as the only predicting factor of absorption as other supramolecular interactions are occurring, are, are involved. And we have now this new hypothesis where we say that the mechanical properties of the film is very important. And if you have a more viscoelastic like film, it means that it will be more challenging to clean. We wanted to know more about the viscoelastic film. So we work with a different surfactant, which is a uh, twin 80. Twin 80, it is extensively used during oil production. Uh, it does not have a charge, it's non-ionic, and it has uh, this branch structure with large molecular weight compared to the previous surfactants that we tested. Uh, twin 80, we tested in different concentrations below and above the CMC without changing the pH to avoid protonation. And we found that twin 80 had a poor absorption into titanium. As you see here, in agreement to previous research, this has been attributed to hydration with its preferential water molecule bonding. And this prevents titania and tunity interactions. Therefore, we work with zirconia and alumina only in this case. And the absorption of tunity can go on, on for hours because the molecules can set assembly on top of each other. So in this case, we truncated the absorption after four hours of running, applying hydraulic cleaning. As a result, we obtained that absorption. Uh, we, as, as expected, we uh, had a higher mass absorbed at higher concentrations here. And we found very low efficiencies in the hydraulic cleaning in general, lower to 35%. So we then applied chemical cleaning in which we could recover, uh, we could recover the, the, the surfaces completely. We did not find uh, statistical differences in the cleaning efficiencies of the two metal oxides or in the concentrations above or below the CMC. And these experiments with Twin80 confirm that viscoelastic films requires more, hydraulic, more than hydraulic cleaning. It seems that the assembly of these films prevents the, pre the penetration of water, and then we need to put a chemical cleaning. So if we look back into the initial hypothesis that we had, we found that yes, we confirmed that surfactant absorption is very important uh, mechanisms uh, for membrane filtration, and simple surfactants can attach irreversible on the on the mem on the metal oxides. Furthermore, we can add now that the mechanical properties of the films uh, can give insights about the cleaning protocols needed, and that the viscoelastic surfactants prove to be the most challenging to to clean. This can be further explored to the optimization of different uh, parameters such as in, in cleaning protocols uh, of ceramic membranes, such as chemical interaction, uh, concentrations, soaking times, hydraulic flush duration, okay? So with this, uh, we finalized the objective one, two, and three. 
And I will move on onto the case application in our uh, objective four. In this case, we apply everything that the method that we develop into this Barini produced water. Uh, our hypothesis was that the organic compounds present in produced water are the major factor impacting the reversible adsorption. We were wondering how can submicron contaminants be characterized in this complex composition of produced water? How can, how can we evaluate the impact and how easy is to remove these organic compounds? So this is the, um, the summary of the experiments that we were doing. Basically, we work only with alumina surface. In this case, alumina is the, uh, the conventional or the most commercially used ceramic membrane material. And uh, we did different steps. So the first one was absorption. You have alumina. We pass the produced water and have, until it's saturated of contaminants. Then we put hydraulic cleaning, millicule water. And finally, we use a chemical cleaning, again, Helmanex to clean the surface. So in the QCMD, this is how it looks, the results. So we have the frequencies, as you know, is similar to mass. We have the dissipations, which is energy dissipation. As soon as we uh, fed the barinium produced water, we saw a first uh, drop in the frequency. So something was absorbing very fast and it reaches a stability after one hour. It was a, a fast kinetic. After that, so, so this one we say, we call it the first layer. So there was a first layer of contaminants. Then we keep feeding and we observe a second drop here, which is a second layer with much higher uh, mass absorbing on the sensor. We, and it keep going and we had to stop it. Actually, we put hydraulic uh, cleaning later. Hydraulic cleaning, could, we could recover the, the surface of the alumina almost, but not completely. So we then apply a chemical cleaning. With chemical cleaning, still after one cycle, we couldn't recover the, the surface of the alumina. So in each of these steps, absorption, hydraulic cleaning, and chemical cleaning, we took a, an image, a microscopy image of the surface of the sensor to look at what was there in each of the steps. So this is how the sensor of the lumina looks uh, in the, the contamin after the contamination with the produced water. We found these elongated shapes uh, in the surface, which we identify as bacteria, and these rocks or solids on top, which we identify as a calcium carbonates probably, because we find a high content of calcium and also carbon and oxygen according to the analysis that we did with uh, SEMEDS. Uh, so this is how it looks contaminated. Now we pass uh, water, molecular water with, with hydraulic cleaning. And this is how the surface looks after hydraulic cleaning. As you see, most of the solids were removed and what is left was basically bacteria. How we knew was bacteria because the shape and also because the composition. You used to see carbon, nitrogen and oxygen high levels here. Now, uh, after the, the, the hydraulic cleaning, we proceed with chemical cleaning. And as you see here in the surface still, we see some uh, contaminants on the surface. We identified that these contaminants actually had, the, some of them, they have the perfect shape of the bacteria, like footprints of bacteria. And also there were some, some lines in this one. We identified that this is most probably uh, extracellular polymeric substances of EPS which are basically uh, polymers that the bacteria release or synthesizes to glue uh, on, the, on the surface. So here bacteria was a key point a constituent in the produced water. So we want to know which communities are we having here. So we proceed with the analysis and we found that we had a broad microbial community uh, found in here in this sample, especially the most prominent were the marinobacterium, which are sulfate reducing bacteria, which are motile with the help of one polar flagellum. And also we found borosive uh, virus, uh, on the other hand, which are sulfur oxidizing bacteria, which have been identified in hydraulic fracturing source waters and also in produced water. So with this, we said bacteria show the, the impact in contamination was key in alumina. We couldn't recover the surface. Um, and besides of that, it seems like these bacteria were promoting the nucleation of calcium precipitates on top of them. So for this, uh, here is an image actually very clear of the bacteria and the solids on top of them. 
So as conclusions, we, we, if we look at the, the hypothesis that we had, yes, organic compounds presently produce water. In this case, was the major impact um, a factor in the reversible absorption. QCND was a great tool for linking the produced water components and the fouling potential and the cleaning strategies. Uh, the combined analysis of QCMD with SEMDX allowed the identification of two viscoelastic layers formed onto the lumina with different mechanical properties in the, and chemical composition. And in this case of a study of this baronium produced water, biofouling might play a key role in a reversible fouling during the ceramic membrane filtration. So as conclusions, well, we uh, successfully accomplished the four objectives. We established methodologies to characterize, visualize, and quantify the submicron produced water contaminants and its absorption interactions with ceramic member materials. These methodologies could be further explored to different applications. For, for instance, areas of my interest will be optimizing the membrane cleaning protocols, testing different chemical agents, uh, changing the, the concentration, soaking times, also absorption, desorption studies in QCND. We could be very helpful to do this before the filtration of pilot testing to save time and expenses in larger scales. It will be very interesting to study corrosion potential of certain produced water uh, quality into specific materials. And on the other hand, there is a growing interest in prolonging the life of injection wells. You know, uh, there is an increasing volume of produced water generating in mature oil fields. Therefore, Another area of interest will be to understand the degree of potential clogging in injection wells due to the absorption of contaminants left in the treated produced water. So with this, I uh, want to show the publication, the results of our work. We had one conference proceeding and four papers um, in the in journal, in peer review journals. We have also the dissemination of results in different international uh, conferences as a speaker. And finally, I want to give my appreciation uh, to a lot of people, starting with Kim Abdullah, Abdulaziz Al Saud, of course, for his great vision of, of CAUS and all the opportunities that CAUS has have provided me during this time. I want to uh, thank to Professor Toro Legnes and also all the research team uh, during these years, especially thanks to Dr. Andrea uh, and Asiyeta Batabai because they were always there um, thinking and planning on how to do the experiments, how to analyze them, and of course, uh, given motivation during all this time. And also I want to give my appreciation to my committee members for taking time to read my paper, my documents. Your comments are greatly appreciated to increase the quality of my work, Professor uh, Nordin, Himanshu, Sigundur, and Professor Hokkion. I uh, also want to give my thanks to Kaos Core Lab, Imagine and Characterization, Ali and Dalaver especially, and the Produce Water Society for opening the, the doors to me as a student to, to show my results and also to hear about the industry needs, and so the and the research and development team for their samples. Also to all my friends, family and courtesies, of course, thank you so much, Guayaquil team as well. And, and lastly, I want to thank to, to me, <laughs> to myself, uh, yes, of course, for all, all the sacrifices during all these years and keeping up with uh, the start and also with the PhD during all these years. Here is my information in LinkedIn. Please don't be afraid to contact me, to ask me questions. Uh, I'm open and let me know uh, what are your questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Sandra, uh, for keeping the time uh, as expected. Uh, thank you for thanking uh, yourself because I think this is the uh, really uh, deserved uh, end of uh, big efforts uh, during the last few years. And a lot of people helped you, that's really uh, uh, appreciated. Uh, so now is the floor is open for uh, open questions for uh, from from audience from friends from uh, professors from uh, anyone else uh, than uh, the committee members which uh, will have time to give other questions unless unless there is a general question from committee members is also welcome. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I think you know how to do that. Uh, 
or just just uh, unmute and talk. Yes, yeah, or you can use the chat as well to 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 write down your your question, please. Okay. Uh, uh, someone but, raised the hand. Yeah, we have already some questions. You can see it, Sandra. All right. Yes. So, but I just I I will uh, moderate to make just organized uh, thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, first question from uh, Maxim. Mm -hmm. Please. Hi, Sandra. Thank you yeah, for Maxine. presentation. Very interesting. Um, well, I, I have two questions, uh, but both are very simple. And um, the first one is about uh, the hydrophobic interactions and the aluminum surface. Um, I'm wondering how did you confirm the existence of those hydrophobic interactions is the reason for, uh, for absorption of, well, where it is, where it should not be, right? Or where it allegedly should not be. Um, that's that's first question, and then the second is well a rather general question. Uh, it's about a QCM. Like you mentioned that there is a viscoelastic uh, adsorb layer, and my understanding is that viscosity is, in simple words, resistance of fluid to flow, right? And in order to have viscosity, something needs to flow. But on the other hand, it is absorbed. Um, and what do you think about it? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maxim. So your question about QCMD was more, how could be viscoelasticity films if you don't have a viscoelastic uh, flow? That's, that's your question? Uh, how, you how does such film exist if uh, it has viscous properties and elastic properties? Mm -hmm. So it is absorbed, but at, at the same same time it has to flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now in this case, uh, we in the chamber of the QCMD, you have a laminar flow, right? That is is passing of the surfactants, and at the end the sensor is is sensing whatever is attached on the on the surface, and the viscoelastic basically is is, is depending on the dissipation, how much dissipation is um, dispersed or energy is dissipating the sensor itself. So in this case, uh, we identify by the value of the dissipation and also by the spread of the frequencies and the overtones, right? So in the simulation, we use the, the void uh, model for this type of, uh, of viscoelastic films in this case. And in, in the, your first question regarding the hydrophobic interface uh, interactions, well, we, we didn't measure properly the, the, the hydrophobic interactions. Basically, our, our hypothesis was validating if there was only because electrostatic interactions. So actually, we went. To, that's why we use charged surfactants. If you look uh, cationic or anionic, we want to see or validate these relationships because what happened right now in, in previous research on um, papers, they are they are be, uh, making very easy conclusions. They are saying, oh, if you have a negatively charged water, you have to use a negatively charged uh, surface or positively charged surface, and it's not a matter of just like this. You know, uh, I have seen these papers. So with this research, we identify that it's, it's not a matter just of the type of uh, uh, surface. It's actually a matter of the surfactants and how they behave. And, and we, ha we found surprising results from, from these very simple surfactants, but still that they can attach irreversibly, irreversibly into the metal oxides. So this, this was the, the main focus, let's say, of the, of the research. I just wanted to comment on this uh, last point that at least according to Graham, Mm -hmm. uh, there is one more kind of interaction, uh, and mm -hmm. he calls it specific interaction. Mm -hmm. And well, in that specific interaction, there is no charge uh, mentioned. It doesn't have to be charged. But, but it's, it's part. Can, it's part of the Van der Waals interactions. No, but... it's a chemical interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, just this, for example, this species, this species, this surfactant, mm -hmm. uh, chemically. Uh, and strongly interacts with, with the surface. Uh, that's it, it doesn't matter what charge it has. Yeah, and actually that, that was the, one of the main conclusions in, in the research that uh, the absorption will, will matter uh, because the nature of the surfactant and not because the type of metal oxide that you were using. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, better for next uh, questions to uh, 
introduce yourself because uh, very interesting questions. I don't know Maxim, but that's fine. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a chemist, so he he, he knows his thing. <laughs> um, my my name is Maxim Yutkin. I I work at Kaust um, with uh, Petroleum Center, oh. and I work in a very similar uh, area, and that's why I, I know what Sandra was talking about. Good. So Thank second you. question from uh, Ju. Hi, this is Chi. Uh, I'm I'm also from the Petroleum Center. I have uh, two questions. The first one regarding the droplet size measurement. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can use cryo uh, TM to measure that because, but we know that it's complex to prepare the sample and it's expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. What about other methods? For example, the dynamic light scattering mm -hmm. can be used to measure the droplet size. That's my first question. Mm -hmm. uh, second question is about uh, um, how significant the surfactant absorption can lead to uh, like a clogging. Um, so what is the pore size of your ceramic material mm -hmm. and how and what will be the thickness of the, you call it a viscoelastic film, how thick the film can be? Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you so much. Yes, for your first question, the lamid light scattering is the most common method for measuring droplet size distribution. The problem is that in produced water, you have not only oil droplets, you have dust, you have bacteria, you have other components, solids. So the dynamic scattering, it's very well and it works perfectly when you have more clean solutions, let's say more pure. So in that case, uh, the problem, the laminate scattering, uh, the, the polydispersity index is, is very high. If you have a very wide range of droplets, you will have a problem because you know, Light scattering measures depending on the intensity of the scatter of the laser, right? And you have very big droplets, which will basically uh, shadow the small ones. So if you measure produced water with dynamic light scattering, it will give you a result, but uh, you won't trust in that result basically, because the, the, as I mentioned, the big droplets will scatter and will shadow the small ones. And also you have dust and fluorescence. And actually in the results, because I also try dynamic light scattering, the results, the errors were very high because it started to have fluorescence and other things. So that's why in this case, we move into, into microscopy techniques, which do give you a number distribution of the droplets yeah, and you can see them as, as they are. Uh, and, and these are more, uh, let's say, you, you can trust more in these results than the dynamic light scattering. But yes, you're completely right. I was comparing the methods actually to see the differences. So, um, and the second question was about how thick was the viscoelastic films and, and the membrane pore size. So in, in microfiltration, you have pore sizes uh, around mm -hmm. 100 nanometer on the range to 400 nanometers some, sometimes. In ultrafiltration, you have 0.1 nanometers. So this is really small or tiny droplets. So for the surfactant, like charged surfactants, there are the small ones. Uh, the thickness were around uh, five nanometers, not that much, so it's well, very small. But for viscoelastic films that were very soft, you can have way thicker than that. You can have 20 nanometers. So you are already talking about the, the reference of the size of the ultrafiltration membranes. You, you can cause intrapore blocking in the ultrafiltration, and it could be significant for the microfiltration as well. Thank you. Uh... Before there was uh, another question from T, but uh, disappeared. Uh, the time, if I uh, want to come back, we have uh, Luisa. Yes, thank you so much. Nice presentation, Sandra. Congratulations. Uh, from water desalination. So after all these research that you've done and first having the assumptions that maybe the droplet size or the tiny, tiny <laughs> droplet oil will be the highest problems for the fouling. And then at the end, looking at biofouling, like one of the also problems regarding the, the clogging of these membranes, how would you rate them like in terms of like the droplet size or the aggregates and what's the role of biofouling in all these pictures that maybe you were not contemplated at the beginning? Yes, actually, that, that's the thing. Like uh, not in all produced water, you have bacteria. So I give you a comparison that this there, the sample from Saudi didn't have bacteria because you had very high uh, salinity there. We didn't see, but in the Borinia one, we had a lower um, uh, salinity and we, we saw these communities. So definitely if you have bacteria, that will be, I would say the number one problem. 
in the in the in the in the biofouling that you will have because the EPS, this glue that I was mentioning that was attaching this is a polymer, this is very strong, and basically you have adhesion there. Uh, after that, um, well, you have the, the problem is that you have other contaminants, you have different surfactants, right? I will say the viscoelastic, whatever viscoelastic that you have in, in your mechanical properties or whatever is attaching, it will be more difficult to clean in this way. So I, I think we need to look more into details of the mechanical properties of the films that are attaching on the, on the surface. Thank you. If uh, no further questions, yeah. We have one from uh, Hyok Su. Yeah, hey. it was a very, hello? Yes, uh, it was a very good presentation. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. It was very informative and uh, uh, learned a lot from your presentation. And especially like uh, interesting to see the, how the interact of uh, oil uh, drop with the infection with the uh, membrane material. Uh, my question is like, uh, do you think uh, this kind of a phenomena and the interaction will be changed in the higher concentration of uh, like uh, oil droplet in the feed? Because like uh, relatively for my understanding, like uh, five or 10 milligram per liter, this kind of range of uh, oil concentration is already good quality of uh, produced water. Like according to like, uh, environmental regulation, already we can just dispose to the like uh, inject back to the well. But the, in the higher concentration, do you think uh, this kind of interaction will be same, similar, or do you have any thoughts about it? Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, yes, at higher concentration, well, what happened is that usually in the conventional treatment, you are removing mostly oil, right? The, the treatment is, is focused on, on the oil. So yes, uh, perfect. You can you can reach the, the regulation of five milligrams or for us as the regulation as it says, but the problem is that you are not removing the other contaminants. What's going on with with the other organics and uh, these aggregates that you have that have submicron contamination? So yes, as you have higher concentration of contaminants, for sure you will have exacerbated effect of, of them uh, interacting with the with the with the membrane, and also considering that we were testing in, in flat, smooth surfaces, right? Imagine now with the, the membrane with the roughness, yeah? Uh, you have higher contact area, definitely will be exacerbated because you have more contact area with in contact with the, with, the, with the contaminants. So yeah, definitely it, it will be exacerbated with more contaminants. Yeah. So by the way, Son is the youngest doctor, say, uh, defended a few days ago. <laughs> doctor Son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think Sandra demonstrated that uh, she is ready to fight with the uh, committee members uh, by giving very clear answers to all questions. So now uh, maybe Max, yeah, I think Maxim is just, uh, yeah, maybe last comment from Maxim. Uh, he wants to say something before we. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about confocal uh, microscopy results. Mm -hmm. um, um, so as far as I understand, so what you did, you took pictures of the micro drops or droplets and um, basically you thresholded them and, and measured the size distribution, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, the question is, well, thresholding is, is sort of subjective. And then my question is, uh, have you calibrated, uh, well, confocal or epi uh, microscopy in your case? Yes, uh, yes. To, to confer, uh, and if you did, yeah. how did you calibrate? Yes, yes, yes. Actually, I, I, I had this in, in my supporting slides, if, if you want to see something. Um, yeah, basically, I, I didn't mention because time, the details about it, but, but definitely. Uh, in this case, if you see, uh, we did a calibration with some bits. Basically, you have the Sika star, in this case, with fluorescence of a specific... Uh, size in one micrometer in this case. And yes, it was a whole protocol that we established because not only the threshold in uh, Maxim, but also the, the previous, uh, when you subtract background, you have to define the size of the pixels or the range of the subtracting background. Uh, so we apply different techniques or different methods and, and with the bits, according to this, we calibrate and we establish, okay, these are, are the methods that we need to apply. And as you see in the, here in the, 
in the x axis, you have the, the threshold level because the threshold was key in defining. So we define a protocol in which you have the closest calculation to the, to the diameter of the, cali of, the, of the bits, right? That is one micrometer. And you have the lowest standard deviation in this case. So yeah, we use this, uh, this standard bits for calibrating the post-processing. Okay, thank you, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for uh, attending uh, Sandra's, uh, the most popular I have seen, uh, 56 people before. Uh, thank you very much for your support. Uh, you can leave, uh, please. Okay, thank you so much. Sandra, you stay. Yes, I stay. <laughs> <laughs>